Hello class, since we started this series of videos on my deck in the winter, I thought you might enjoy seeing my deck in the summertime. It's a lot hotter out here. I've had to put an umbrella up just to get a little bit of shade, but I hope you enjoy the, the background as we finish off with this last video. In 1923, Jay Gresham Machen, the great New Testament Greek scholar, published a book called Christianity and Liberalism. The thesis of the book was simple. Liberalism and Christianity are two totally different religions. He was not referring to political liberalism or philosophical liberalism, but to the liberal approaches to Christianity based on a naturalistic philosophy and not based on the historical grammatical understanding of the Bible. His central argument has value even today. It goes like this, and I quote, It is no wonder, then, that liberalism is totally different from Christianity, for the foundation is different. Christianity is based upon the Bible. It bases upon the Bible both its thinking and its life. Liberalism, on the other hand, is founded upon the shifting emotions of sinful men. Whether we like it or not, if we claim to be Christians, our beliefs must be based upon a legitimate, historically and grammatically defensible understanding of the Bible. That's why biblical theology is very important to our ministries. If we're going to build a belief system upon what God has actually revealed, then we need to listen to the conversation in the scriptures. As we conclude, I want to look at what Jesus teaches us about listening to the conversation through his own use of the Old Testament. The first principle is that Jesus reminds us that every unit of teaching in the Bible has a goal. If we're to understand that teaching, we must look at it, then look at that material in light of that goal. This is clear in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 18. Let's read that. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. In that passage, he talks about fulfilling and accomplishing the law. Jesus says he had not come to destroy the law, but to bring it to completion. The language implies that there's some sort of goal or end connected to the law. To understand what Jesus meant, we must remember that the law was Israel's theocratic constitution. In Deuteronomy 28 and verse 1, after rehearsing all the law said regarding Israel's national life, we read this statement. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed. The passage goes on for the next 12 verses to outline all the ways God would bless the nation when they obeyed his law. The goal of the law was blessing. Israel's obedience would lead to divine blessing that would distinguish the nation from all other countries and make them an earthly manifestation of his glory. When Jesus said he had come to fulfill the law, this is what he had in mind. His death and resurrection ensured that all of God's blessings would, Paul, would fall upon believing Israel as a result of new covenant transformation. His obedience would make their blessing and glorification possible. In the new covenant, God promised to write his law to the human heart. That is, ensure that everything the law demanded was realized by divine, not human initiative. This is exactly what uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4 says. For what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin and sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. With that done, the law was complete. Its goal had been reached. So many debates and misuses of the Mosaic Law would be avoided if interpreters just followed the principle Jesus set out in this passage. The law had a goal. The goal was blessing, and that goal would ultimately only be realized through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And when Jesus died and rose and inaugurated the new covenant, 
the goal of the law was met. It was fulfilled. It was no longer necessary. In biblical theology, our pursuit of a theological center or the plot or point of a storyline um, is an attempt to identify the goal of the teaching. But the only way to identify that goal is to listen to the conversation. Now we might ask, what is the goal or the theological focus of the Sermon on the Mount? It's impossible to answer that question unless we understand the conversation taking place in the Gospel of Matthew as a whole. It's easy to cast our grid over any unit of teaching, to interpret it in light of a relevant or desired framework that we hold. But to understand what God is saying, we must listen to the conversation as a third party, and an outsider who's seeking to comprehend what two other people are talking about. When we do that, we're on our way to appreciating the goal the speaker had in mind, a goal that guided and shaped what he said. Now, the second principle that I notice in Jesus' use of the scriptures is this. Preconceived ideas deafen us to the conversation in the text. We see that clearly in Matthew chapter 15, verses 2 to 6. Let's read that. Then the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles his father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or mother, what I, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father or mother. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now herein lies our greatest challenge as students of the Bible. Tradition is a well-established well -established history of interpretation and application. Often it's so deeply ingrained that we think the traditional meaning of a text is obvious, the only possible way to understand the text. When someone takes it another way, we say things like, you just need to take the passage at face value, or you must accept the plain sense of the words. It seems incredulous to us that anyone cannot see the text as we see the text. So when we read, the just shall live by faith, we immediately think about the way people are saved. That's what we have been taught since the Reformation. It's obvious, that's what it means. Never mind that when God said that to Habakkuk, regarding it was de dealing with his walk with God, not the way that he would enter a relationship with God or receive imputed righteousness. It was about living by faith as a believer. Now, Jesus was misunderstood because he cut through tradition and got back to the original conversation. A conversation that contained a powerful message with powerful truths. This, more than anything else, explains why his teaching was different from that of the scribes and the Pharisees, which everyone noticed. Look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 29. The people recognized it had power, but they didn't know why it had power. Today, some say it's because he was God. But since he chose to live as a man while he was on earth, I say it was because he got back to the actual teaching of the scriptures, which were always powerful. I think the veil mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4 is a metaphorical representation of this Jewish tradition. I think the veil mentioned in 2 Corinthians 3 through 4 is a metaphorical representation of Jewish tradition. G or Paul calls it the letter that kills, which we know is not the law since in other places he says the law is good and it is spiritual, like in Romans 7, 14 to 16. It's not the law, but the traditional understanding of the law that serves as a veil. And Paul says that these traditions blinded the Jews every time they heard the Tanakh. In 2 Corinthians 3.15, every time they heard the scriptures read in their synagogues, a veil was on their minds, blinding them to the actual message of their own scriptures. Now, in our reading of the text, we must ask God to help us set aside our preconceived ideas about its meaning. Rather than starting with commentaries or other human explanations of the text, just go into the Bible and study the passage in its own literary context. Listen to the conversation. 
not to other people talking about the conversation. After you've really got a feel for what it's being said there, then you can read those other sources. Now, there's a third principle Jesus teaches us. Lazy, a lazy approach to grammar and literary features changes the conversation, Matthew 22, 29. Now, you know the story there, Matthew 22, the, the, the Sadducees have come to him and they've told the story of a family where the law of Leverite marriage was applied. You know, a woman marries a man, he dies before they have children, so the law said that his brother had to go and raise up a child for his name, for the sake of his inheritance. This happened two or three times, and now the Sadducees say, okay, so whose wife will she be in the resurrection? And this is how Jesus answers. But Jesus answered them, you are wrong, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. God revealed the truth about himself, people, and the world through human language. According to his decision, some of that revelation was preserved in an inspired book, the Bible. Now, that sounds like class one Sunday school material, but I fear the implications of that basic principle escape many Christians. We cannot understand the Bible. We cannot get to the truth it contains about God, people, and the world unless we pay attention to grammar, syntax, and other literary tools. This is the point Jesus makes in Matthew 22, 32. He chides the Pharisees because they did not know the scriptures. He points out that had they paid attention to the grammar of one of their favorite verses, Exodus 3 and verse 6, they would have realized that death does not mean annihilation. All who have ever lived are still alive. The text says the crowd was astonished at his teaching. But he did nothing more than pay attention to grammar. And I think that's true today. If we just pay attention to what the text says, we will be able to deliver remarkable insight to the people that we teach and train. To listen to the conversation, we need to remember the difference between a subject and an object. We need to pay attention to the tense of verbs. We need to remember that a word's meaning is determined more by its literary context than by a dictionary entrance. Pay attention to the grammar and the literary structure. They represent the intent and meaning of the person speaking in the original conversation. Fourth principle we learn from Jesus' use of the scriptures. People need God's word, not experience or miracles. Luke 16, 19 to 31. Now again, you know the context of this story. It's a story of the rich man and Lazarus. They die. Rich man goes to hell. The Lazarus goes into the bosom of Abraham. Rich man cries out, please help me in my suffering. And then when there's no help coming to him, he says, go warn my brothers so they don't come to this place. This is where we pick it up. And then he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him, Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Here Jesus speaks to the question, what do people really need? We tend to think that seeing is believing, but, but that has never been the case. We have an incredible ability to see what we want to see, no matter how that differs from reality. The religious leaders saw the miracles of Jesus, look at John eleven forty seven, 47, and they saw the miracles of the apostles, look at Acts 4 and verse 16, but they did not believe. Why? Because they did not believe Moses and the prophets, John chapter 5 and verse 46. So those miracles that were forecast by the prophets meant nothing to them. They were lost on those people. All of this is a reminder that people need to hear that's the word that is used. They need to hear Moses and the prophets, Luke 16, 29. 
Jesus is saying that the rich man's kinfolk needed to hear what Moses and the prophets were saying, not what the rabbis were saying. They needed to listen to that conversation because God has chosen to work through it. Another principle I see in Jesus' use of the Old Testament in Matthew chapter 19. When God designs something, he is providing a pattern, a pattern or a paradigm that has abiding spiritual and moral influence. Now, you remember the context here. Uh, the Pharisees, again, are trying to trick Jesus. They want to ask him to align himself on one of the, with one of the major schools of debate at his time. Let's read the passage. And the Pharisees came to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and, be, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Jesus sets out an important benefit of listening to the conversation. We are able then to develop models or paradigms that enable us to understand life in subsequent revelation. The Pharisees think they have a thorny theological issue with which to trip up Jesus. Do you align with the liberals or the conservatives on the matter of divorce? At that time, there were two major schools of thought on divorce. The school of Shammai used Deuteronomy 24, 1-4 to argue that divorce was permissible only when there was marital unfaithfulness. The school of Hillel understood the passage to teach that divorce was permissible for any form of marriage incompatibility. Jesus does not align with any way or engage in any way with the current theological debates. Instead, he gives them a framework within which to understand Deuteronomy 24, 1-4. That framework is drawn from God's actions in Genesis 2. Jesus establishes that what God designed in Genesis 2 had ongoing moral implications. A pattern was established, and everything that took place after that had to be true to that pattern. It's a powerful example of using moral paradigms drawn from Scripture to frame later discussions. Finally, the last thing I want to mention is everything, sixth principle, everything in the Bible is about relationships one way or another. Matthew 7, 12 and Matthew 22, 36. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Teacher, which is the great commandment, the greatest commandment in the law? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and prophets, Matthew 22, 36 to 39. Jesus makes a powerful and profound observation when he says, this is the law and the prophets. It's a simple equation. The law and the prophets equal this. The law and the prophets are about the way we treat people, including God. Everything God has ever said parses out how we are to love him and love each other. So if the trajectory of our teaching does not move to that objective, then we have misunderstood the scriptures. When God explained in Romans 1 that homosexuality is a rejection of general revelation, that is the revelation in our own bodies, he did it to empower us to love people and to help them find the beauty of his plan. He did not do it so that we would hate, abuse, or shun homosexuals. As Paul said to Timothy, even when we're dealing with false teaching, the goal of our instruction is love. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. Well, I've just scratched at this subject. Jesus provides many other tips on how we can effectively listen to the conversation. I want to challenge you to read the Gospels with an eye to finding them. It'll be worth the effort. And I want to challenge you as you continue to minister to use this more descriptive approach of New Testament theology to listen to the conversation. Be the third party. 
be nosy, listen in, snoop uh, on what someone else is saying and try to understand what that original writer is saying to those readers, why he's saying it, and, and what the implications are of that. And, and that, will, that will bring great insight into your study of the Word of God and the ability to really then apply it effectively in your world and in your time. It's been great being with you in this class. Uh, it would have been a lot of fun to be together in person. I know I would have enjoyed getting to know all of you at that level, but uh, God knew that we should meet uh, online, and I hope in the future that I will meet you in a, a, a real on-site class sometime with ABTS, or maybe just sometime when I'm in Asia. I'll run into you. That would be a blessing to me. Thank you, and the Lord bless you.